awesome to be amongst uh, 700 people who have such common cause. It really, the energy here has just got me so psyched this morning. So that's, I want to talk about our common cause. Um, and it starts here. I went a couple months ago to visit the Royal Society of, of London. Uh, and I was there to talk to them uh, about a report they'd put out on computer science education in the British secondary school system, something I care a lot about, Mozilla cares a lot about. And that was a fun conversation. But what was much more exciting was here's this organization you may think of as quite staid. And I was in this room with quite senior people, basically the, the VP of research, uh, and so idealistic. And this is the, the motto of the Royal Society, which is take no one's word for it. And, it's, and now it's interesting as a cause, right? Uh, we all have a cause, but here's this cause of science, which you know, as an ideological project, other than maybe religion, probably one of the more successful ideological causes in history. And here are these people who are just still getting up every day excited about it. And I talked to them a little bit about it. In fact, I saw the mace that they got 352 years ago when they got their charter, uh, you know, about the history of the organization. And here is an organization that really started as a set of radicals who had a cause. And not they alone, but they still exist today, these people getting up every day, filled with idealism, trying to advance that cause, one that's been quite successful. And so it made me think a little bit about our cause. What does our cause look like? What are the stakes if we look at on that kind of time horizon? And what does it look like to fuse what we believe in as the open internet that deeply into society that 352 years from now, people get up, feel idealistic, and care about what we care about here today? So that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about at least what I think of as our cause, the essence of our cause. I want to talk a bit about what I think are some strategies we can use to advance that cause. And I want to talk about that long game. Because I think, well, there are urgent stakes today. The stakes are much bigger than even Susan talked about uh, over the long run. So first, our cause. Um, one of the things I was very happy to, to find when I came to Mozilla three years ago, is I, I have boring jobs like talking to the IRS, but it also means I, I go back and I read things like our corporate charter. Uh, and in our corporate charter from 2003, it says in the very first paragraph, Mozilla exists to guard the open nature of the internet. It's a pretty awesome job. I get to put that on my business card. Um, and so that's, I think, a cause that most of us or all of us in this room share. But I, you know, it's also one I've spent three years failing to communicate to the public as being important. And I think you know, other than what happened with ACTA and SOPA recently, we've all failed to communicate why that matters to the public as a cause. And so I'm thinking about that a little bit. What is there that's deeper? What is it that makes us excited about that cause? And maybe what is that cause at its essence? So I went back actually to when I was 15. And I thought, well, what was my first cause? Um, so that is me. That's my yearbook picture, which they banned because I was smoking. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so my first cause, of course, is, is punk rock. You know, beautiful, wonderful, magnetic, creative, free social movement. Uh, you know, something that you know, completely got me excited, got tens, hundreds of millions around the world, still has tens, hundreds of millions of people around the world excited, and it's certainly about something. Uh, and, you know, interestingly enough, as a side note, it's a cause that very much was at the intersection of creativity and, and freedom and technology. And so, you know, the four-track cassette recorder, home studio, and other things come out, really democratize who can put out a record or who can just put out a, a cassette. My weapon of choice, of course, well, not of course, but I'm not a musician, unlike my children. Uh, my weapon of choice was a photocopier. I was the sort of flyer art uh, kid. And, you know, there's a lot in that flyer art and in punk rock was very similar to what we stand for today. You know, I was cutting and pasting. I was ripping things apart. I just didn't have, I only had a VIC-20, so, you know, couldn't really create flyer art. I had to still use glue. And the thing that is at the essence for me of punk rock, and I think is possibly at the essence of our cause, really is creativity and freedom. Was this impulse to make something, as, you know, 1.2 billion people who are on social networks today have that impulse, and to do it in a way where I don't have to ask anybody's permission to be out there and be connected and be me. And so I think there's something in the idea that maybe creativity and freedom, but creativity first, 
is a part of what emotionally connects a lot of those people who have gotten out on the street with SOPA and ACTA to the internet, and is a part of a bigger cause that maybe we've been playing with for a while. And so certainly, I felt very at home as a kind of the punk rock kid when I first got one of these. How many people had one of these? Just as a, and, and you know, the, the sound of negotiating the handshake kind of sounded like a guitar buzzing, right? <laughs> so you can see there is a spiritual connection. And what's amazing is with a lot of those, we created this. And this is beautiful, right? We made this out of creativity of freedom, out of this DIY ethic of, you know, first building heath kits and then hooking up modems and then connecting ourselves together. And the stakes right now around this are very high. And the, a core piece of what is going on with this is there are two visions of what this becomes. One is based on creativity and freedom, and it is the open protocols, the open source software, the end-to-end -end principle. Those are the things that built this. Those are the things that have built the wealth and the creativity that is the internet. Uh, those are the things that what we talk about here and celebrate have been built on. But there is a vision of the internet, and it's also what we're talking about here, which is about prescription and control. And maybe you want to call it the internet, maybe you don't. But there is a vision of the internet which is about great firewalls, which is about laws that break the DNS system, which is about app stores that you have to ask permission to get into. And that is a different internet than the one we have built. So we are actually arm wrestling over these two visions of the internet. And of course, you know, that one, the internet's pretty dark. That one is the one that I think we all dream of, which brings a lot of light. And having that creativity and freedom version of the internet continue is incredibly important, and you can't really see it up there, uh, but it's important not just because we care about the internet, because the internet is so infused into the lives of billions of people now, and billions more coming online through phones, that it affects you know, the economy, our community, love, friendship, you know, how things work for humanity. And so, you know, the stakes that we are talking about in terms of what the internet becomes are stakes for humanity. Where goes the internet, that is where we will all go. So, it seems to me useful to have a strategy to make it go in a good place. Um, and I think there's three things that we will talk about here. I'm gonna talk about one of them in more depth because I don't think we talk about it enough. One is we need to be thinking about the policy piece. And frankly, those of us, especially Mozilla in this space, talk about it very poorly. We're babies at it. So we need to get better at that. Although I do think that what happens in the Beltway and what happens in Brussels is actually the third most important thing to think about. It's important, we suck at it, we could lose at it, but it actually isn't the most important thing. The other place is we need to be thinking about product. Product that bakes in the values of the internet, bakes in what it was there to do. So product that is designed to make us all producers and not just consumers. And the design decisions we make around websites and products and hardware, those design decisions influence over the long run what the internet becomes. Probably more than policy. Certainly that's been the case up to now. It's why you know, Firefox was a market play as opposed to just thinking that we could beat Microsoft in the courts. Uh, but the third piece, which I don't think we talk about enough, is literacy. We need the world, we need a much bigger part of the world to understand the mechanics and the code that makes the web run and keeps it open. And the good news is people are starting to agree with me about this, although it isn't the conversation we normally have here. This is the conservative minister of culture in the UK uh, who says even a basic understanding of computer coding will help you understand the structure of your digital life. We want people to understand and be able to shape the structure of their digital life. But despite the fact that I think that's obvious, I still get a lot of what the fuck and a lot of why when I say, let's actually consider teaching kids to code one of the most political things we can do for the internet. And the reason I do that is the digital world we live in is made up of Lego, wonderful Lego, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, all of these free pieces we can all use. But if we don't understand them, they're both under threat, but also you know, we don't have any agency. And so I, I explain that often to people who kind of don't believe it's important by bringing my son Ethan on the screen. So here's Ethan, he's 10. Uh, he loves to make things with Lego. He also loves the web a lot. And the things he loves are exactly the things you should love about the web. 
Uh, these are things I get to be introduced to by Ethan. But he loves even more this. He loves that within you know, a day or two, Rebecca back getting, getting out of bed, is Chad Vader getting out of bed? Ethan lives and loves living in a world of mashups. And it's a world that has been designed to be a world of mashups. Tim Berners-Lee built the idea that the web should be Lego into its very design. And that's one of the things that is under threat. And so, you know, he designed it, and the others who, who designed pieces of the web designed it to give us that, but using this, using a system where we can see the lines of the Lego, understand how they work, take them apart, and build something else. And it's not just critical that we keep it that way, it's critical that we understand it, and that hundreds of millions of more people understand it. So, you know, the web was designed to be Lego. One of the things I think we need to do beyond thinking about policy and product is help Ethan know this, and help Ethan know how it works. Because if we don't, well, if we do, he taps into that creativity of freedom. It becomes close and connected to him. If we don't, I think we end up in this world of prescription and control, where we're consumers again, and we can end up there. And more importantly, you know, where we don't actually get to shape what the device does to be able to decide what it's for and publish content to it. That is a different version of the internet, a different vision of the internet, and it's not mine. So the long game in all of this, and this is where I, I finish, I mean, part of the long game for me is young people knowing how all of this world works and controlling it and shaping it more than any of us do. And you know, when you ask how do you do that, the one example I've, I've thought of a lot, and it, it kind of gives me some solace, is scouting. And Scouting, uh, lots of reasons, not because of badges and stuff, there's lots of nice things about scouting, but it's an example of an organization that had a social innovation, it was able to insert deeply and fuse into society that I think has had some beneficial effects. Any guesses what that social innovation was? Not badges, I love badges, but not badges. No, not cookies. <laughs> Camping. So civilian camping is not something in 1907 when Baden-Powell starts the scouts that is a mainstream phenomena. In fact, it's a phenomena that only the military, pioneers in wagons, and prospectors really know about. It's an arcane technical activity requiring a lot of equipment. Nobody would have thought to do it. Uh, it certainly wasn't something you did for recreation. But what happens is, in the quest to connect, connect young people to nature, urban young people, and the Sierra Club does a similar thing with hiking, you know, camping becomes a mainstream phenomenon. It's no longer just something that professionals do. So how many people are professional campers? Okay, that's good, I'm, there are some. How many people in this room like to camp? And so now we live in a society, I'm Canadian so I can't say this country, but also this country, filled with national parks, filled with resources we have a social consensus to protect, Part, in, in fact, a significant part of that social consensus is because we have a positive, personal, emotional relationship with those places. So what if we could do that with coding? What if we could do that with the internet? Where the basic design principles, the things that we love about the internet, are a part of what we all experience and get to do with the internet. The coding is something that is primarily done by all of us and not just done by engineers a hundred years from now. That's something I think we can do, and certainly when you think of the hundreds of millions of people who have been scouts over the years, uh, it is something we can see models for and achieve, and it starts to get us into that long view. But I know, just to close, there are people here who are impatient. Uh, I am also impatient, so what do we do now? How do we get on this path? Uh, certainly, you know, the idea I have, and I think that we all live in our lives, is this idea of baking creativity and freedom into everything. So that means baking it into how we think about policy, that people in the Beltway and in Brussels see creativity and freedom as the right principle, and certainly they have a, a don't break this damn internet approach to what's going on. Product, absolutely, is another thing we need to do as a part of the strategy now. So you know things like Tumblr, things like SoundCloud, things like the, the new web phone that we're trying to build, where self-expression is at the core of the product as well as web standards and open source being at the core of the product, I think are essential to shaping where we go. And then of course building 
a scouting movement for the web, which Mozilla has taken on as something that it wants to lead, but we need millions of people to do that with us uh, as a third piece of the, the strategy. But the last thing I think we need to do, and we're talking a lot about it here, and I think we need to get it right really soon, is think about just the, the poetry of it. And so, you know, here's Tim Berners-Lee saying the web evolved into a powerful, ubiquitous tool because it was built on egalitarian principles. How do we deeply telegraph those egalitarian principles so that everyone who is touched by the web and cares about it can repeat them and know them? And maybe that's a Bill of Rights, which I would support us doing. Maybe it's a Magna Carta, which M Rebecca McKinnon talks about and I think is a, another interesting frame. Maybe it's a quick logo or, or tagline like the world is made of Lego, let's keep it that way. I, I don't know what it is, but we need something that will stick in people's minds and transmits those egalitarian principles and lets every decision be made around them. And I think if we can do that, if we can get to that and let it move telegraphically and virally, 352 years from now, people will uh, wake up and they'll go to work and they'll be idealistic about what we all care about today and that's what we need to do, and I think we can. Thanks very much.